Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to go back to the Word of God. If it's not obvious to you, go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 to verse 31. Isaiah 40th chapter. Start at verse 28. And forgive me, I love everybody. Welcome, everybody. So great to see you. I just want to get right into this word. Go ahead. I have an English Standard Version. Are we there? Isaiah 40, starting at verse 28, says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord, that's capital L-O-R-D, is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth and even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall be shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Yeah. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Yeah. They shall walk and not faint. Thus in the reading of God's holy Hallelujah. word. I want to get real back this for, uh, for a minute. And I want you to look at your neighbor. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. no worries. No worries. God, is God is working while we are waiting. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. No worries. No worries. God is working. God is working. While we are waiting. While we are waiting. Amen. 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 Give God some praise. Amen. Father, we thank you for this moment that you've afforded a portion and afforded to us for, for preaching and teaching. God, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and to our minds. God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Listen, Amen. no worries, y'all. God is working while you, while we are waiting. That's some good news right there. That's some good news right there. Yes, it is. But let me take you back. Let me take you back for a minute. You know I like movies, so I'm going to give you a movie reference here. In 1995, martial arts actor Jean-Claude Van Damme starred in the action thriller Sudden Death. Playing the role of Darren McCord, a French Canadian firefighter. Mm -hmm. McCord had been assigned uh, fire marshal duties at the Pittsburgh Civic Arena during the Stanley Cup Finals. And as a surprise to his children, he brought them along to watch the hockey game. In the stands, he instructs them to remain in their seats as he needed to attend to some business. While he's gone, domestic terrorists are shown taking the VP of the United States and other officials hostage in an effort to extort several millions of dollars. Now, to encourage their compliance, the kidnapper informs them of his intent to blow up the arena if his demands were not met. Meanwhile, McCord's unattended kids get into an argument. The son makes fun of the daughter, and the daughter yells back at the son. The son pulled out his water gun and sprayed the daughter with water, causing her to steal her drink. The daughter was soaked and understandably went to the bathroom to clean herself up. However, the son stayed in his seat. The daughter ended up being kidnapped too. She was uh, she she wasn't where she was supposed to be, uh, and she ends up getting kidnapped. And the race to save her and everyone all else ensued. A disruption occurred, causing everyone in the stadium to evacuate. But McCord's son remembered that he wasn't supposed to move from a seat. Eventually, McCord defeated the terrorists, rescued his daughter, and returned to the stands to recover his son. In their reunion, McCord's son says to him, I didn't move, Dad. I didn't move. Not even when things blew up, I didn't move. See, McCord's son knew that he was in a difficult situation. He, he watched as the people around him fled for their lives, but, but he sat still and held fast to the directive of his father. He believed that his father, upon his return, would relieve him of his responsibility of waiting. Yeah. I never knew John Claude Van Damme to preach. Yeah. <laughs> Saints, waiting is a natural consequence of our existence. A pregnant woman waits for the delivery of her baby. A sick person waits for the results of an examination. 
A motorist with a flat tire waits for the tow truck. A diner waits for the delivery of his or her food. We all experience waiting in various ways and for various amounts of time. And generally, the conclusion of waiting produces a sense of relief and to a greater extent, a sense of joy. Now, I ask the question, why? Why does it do that? And may I suggest that it's because waiting is simply a pause between hope and fulfillment. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh. Said another way, waiting is the time between the declaration and the delivery. Yes. Pause for just a second. On the surface, that statement might seem comforting, and I agree that it is, but I, I'd be derelict in my duty as a preacher if I didn't ask you to consider the tension in such a statement. Yeah. Think about it for a moment. Often, if not always, during the waiting period, there are opportunities to grow weak, weary, and woeful. Things like setbacks, struggles, and sorrow threaten our ability and furthermore our willingness to wait. For example, the children of Israel complained to Moses after their exodus from Egypt and prior to their arrival in the promised land. God told them, you will possess their land. I will give it to you as an inheritance, a land flowing with milk and honey. Israel had reached the western Sinai desert and instead of holding on to the message, God shared with them through his servant Moses, they allowed their perceived circumstances to turn their hope into despair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got mad because they ain't had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. Yet a God who is invisible rescued them from a physical oppressive hand. Yeah. And then made the oppressors fund their deportation. Yeah. Their exodus. Y'all remember Egypt was like, here, take it all. Just leave us alone. Yeah. Talk about your enemy becoming your footstool. Family, the road ahead might be bumpy, barren, or even flat out look bad. Every now and again, we by our own doing or by no fault of our own, will find ourselves in an uncomfortable position and that's in that place, and it's in that place where we must cling to the good tidings found in God's promise of pardon. The writer of Isaiah 40 wrote to a believing body of people who were enduring the stress of being disciplined by God through Assyria, and to the future generation of folks who would have to suffer exile by God through Babylon. Due to their consistent and perpetual apostasy, God used both Assyria and Babylon to reorient his covenant community, their heart back to him. Now again, pause for a, a quick moment because again, that, that, that's, that's noble and, and that's a good thing. But, but the process of reorientation can be peculiar and even painful. God in his providence led his people away from him in order to lead him back to them. God, in his divine providence, led his people away from him in order to lead them back to him. Yeah. That's a head scratch. Yeah. That's that, 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 you gotta, you gotta let that marinate for a little bit so that some flavor develops. You just can't eat that right away. Yeah. And, 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 and to help us understand it, look, look at the text. Look, we're going to the text. The text says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The people had already walked away from their devotion and commitment to God. So he gave them over to their desires. Saints, sometimes when we're disobedient, God lets us wallow in our disobedience. Because we want, we don't want to listen to him. We don't want to obey him. We don't want to follow him. So he throws his hands up and says, fine, that's how you want it. Go ahead. Revel in it. Yeah. You think you're enjoying it now, but you're going to pay for it later. You're going to be sorry about it later. You're going to feel bad about it later. You will have regret. And so he had them carried away as punishment. But his grace and mercy made 
for penitence. God never gave up on his people. He executed his divine plan for his glory and their good. Friends, we may not comprehend or even agree with God's methods. Lord knows I sometimes be like, God, why and what are you doing? But since he is sovereign yes, over all things, and we are not, yes, we can rest assured that his will and his way are both pleasing and perfect to him. The Lord, the capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, is eternal. Yes. The Lord, Yahweh, is the creator. He, unlike us, never tires. Yes. God has never and will never become exhausted. His intelligence, his wisdom is limitless and therefore beyond the bounds of human comprehension. God is not constrained by the natural law. He established the law and gave it to us as a principle for our conduct. Yeah. Now, why is all of that significant? Because this knowledge is what gets employed when the tension between hope and fulfillment increases or becomes unbearable. Yeah. God and God alone sustains us during the waiting period. Church, as we, as much as we want to believe our family, our friends, or I mean, even our finances, help us to maintain our faith, they do not. Why? Because all of them are fickle. Yeah. Family is fickle. Yes, friends are fickle. Finances can be fickle because you may not have much of it. Yes, and even if you do have much of it, you may not know what to do with it. You may not be stewarding it properly, but even in the tension between hope and fulfillment, finances ain't gonna keep you happy. They will fail you. They will fail you. Look at the text. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, or to her who has no might, he increases strength. God told his people that he would confer on them power. Power to overcome their mental and spiritual weariness. He also told his people that he would multiply their abundance in strength. Strength. These, he's, he's speaking and writing to a worn out people group. And the thing about it is, it was their fault. I know, Sam, sometimes we don't want to. We don't want to own up to our responsibility. We don't want to own up to our our part in it. And so, of course, you go from one oppressor to the to the to the next. Again, remember Isaiah. This Isaiah is speaking in the present, but also in the future. He's speaking to a group that had been oppressed by Assyria, and he's speaking to the group that would be oppressed. Exiled by Babylon. And it was their fault. He had told them. He told David. Hey, if you obey me, your king, your, 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 everything works out. But you disobey me, you got some of the consequences. And so here in this, this period, this is a tough period for, for Israel. Here in this period, they are weak. They're weary. They're worn out. I don't know about you. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not speaking prophetically, but, but I know there are some folk in here who are weak. You're worn out. You're tired. Every time you turn on the TV, it's something after, it's one thing after the other. You are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You are tired of dealing with the same issue over and over and over and over again. You want out. You just want it to end. You want it to be over. But God is saying today that you have to wait. And not on the outcome that you are wanting. Yes. Come on. Not on the outcome that you are anticipating. Because whatever it is, whatever it is, however it is, if God permits it, that's that's what we want. That, that's, that's what we want. We want God to come through in the way that God desires to come through. Like I said, waiting is, is not all, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a precarious situation. It's not always easy, right? When you was a kid and you wanted dessert, 
and you ask your parents for dessert, generally they say, wait, you got to wait after dinner. And then you got the dinner, you just shovel all that stuff in your mouth because you wanted to get to the dessert. And then meanwhile, in between you shoveling it in your mouth and then trying to get the dessert, now your stomach is hurting. Because you try to accelerate the way in theory. Yes. You try to move, you try to move forward so fast that you can get to the thing that you were hoping and wanting to get. But see, there's time. There is a process. There is a, a walking this thing through. And so God in his divine and infinite wisdom was drawing his people back to him in this waiting period. See, the people of God had sought after other forms of support and discovered them to be fictitious and impotent. However, God gave them an opportunity to rediscover his all-sufficiency. And brothers and sisters, sometimes God will break us down to build us back up. The Apostle Paul stated in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. God created space for his people to acknowledge and accept that in lieu of their abandonment to him, he was still working on their behalf. He reinforced his desire for their loyalty to him and dependency on him. Family, God wants us to learn the lesson that without him, we are weak, but with him, we are strong. See, in the animal kingdom, it's often demonstrated, Brother Dean, that survival occurs when in community and not in isolation. What's more, the animal that leaves the protection of its family typically ends up injured, or worse than that, ends up dead. Friends, I submit that we can avoid injury and death by remembering that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of struggle. Our refreshment and revitalization will not come from the reformation of human systems. Rather, it will come from a relationship with the Lord. I'll say that again. Our refreshment and revitalization will not come from the reformation of human systems. About relationship. It will not come from human systems. Rather, it will come from our relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not downing us having things or, or things or, or whatever the case may be. Those are in their proper perspective. But if you want true deliverance, if you want true healing, if you want true peace, if you want true joy, if you want to experience unconditional love, it's not found in those things. It never can be and never will be. It's only found through a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. God is the center. God is the hub. God is the, uh, the, the, the one that we resolve, revolve around rather than the other way around. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> And so he, 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 he reminds them that it is he who gives the power. Right. And that it is he that increases the strength. But, but again, the, the, the understanding in the text for them would have been, I need to acknowledge that I'm faint. I need to acknowledge that I am weak. I need to acknowledge that I am in need, in need of strength. See, sometimes we get so big and bad, we get so high and mighty that, that we feel like we can do this on our own, that, that God is, a, is an accessory rather than the main thing, that God is an additive rather than the main ingredient. We look at God as, as something that, that we is, is an option rather than an essential. And that's where we can get into trouble. That's where things get tough. And so here in this text, he's saying, those that are weak in faith, those that are powerless, I will offer, I will provide power and strength. So again, uh, the Apostle Paul undergirds that, 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 that notion, that thought, that, that in our weakness, we
we are made strong. So the question you have to ask yourself is how weak do you want to get? <laughs> how strong do you want to be? Because if you want to, if you want strength, then you need to get weak. Paul had that thorn in his side. He acknowledged that, yo, this is not about me. It's about God. It's to keep me in check. It's to help me understand that everything that I do, all that I say, the ministry that he's given to me, is not for me to brag and boast. It's not for my glory, but it's for his glory. And so he's bringing the people back to a place where they can acknowledge it and not just acknowledge it, dare I say, accept it. And that's what God does to us. He brings us back to a place where we can acknowledge it's him, not us, and we can accept it's him and not us. And when we do that, when we surrender and submit, then we can move forward. Then we can, then we can, we can do what the what the text says for us to do. It says, even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Saints, everyone at some point falls victim to the restrictions imposed by God on his creation. No one is invincible. No one is perfect. Human endurance and perseverance are terminal. Yes. However, where they end, God's provision begins. Faith seeks understanding. That's what theology is. Faith seeking understanding. So where our human ingenuity ends, God takes up and moves forward. Now, there is a caveat, a stipulation that we must attend to in the text. See, the power and strength afforded by God to his people are, again, assigned to those who are willing to wait. He said, but they that wait. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And again, waiting is a natural consequence of our existence, and sometimes waiting requires patience. Mm -hmm. French philosopher, writer, and lawyer Joseph Demastre posited, to know how to wait is the great success, the great secret of success. Now, the word wait in the text is a Hebrew word, kavah, which means to wait for, to twist, or stretch. Kavah is in the Hebrew, uh, kavah in the text is a Hebrew word uh, derived from kav, which means cord, with an emphasis on the tension generated from its twisting and stretching. What are you saying, preacher? Essentially, the writer wanted his audience to understand that they would need to endure the tension of waiting, the time between the declaration and the delivery. Yes. See, another way to understand the writer's message would be to consider Israel's idea of hope. Hope for God's people hinged on their trust in the covenant God of their ancestors. Hope had nothing to do with wishful thinking or optimism. See, again, the world, society, human construct says uh, we, we, we hope for the, the best outcome, regardless of the situation. We, we, we see the best outcome. I, I said it in the Bible study. My wife tells me I'm the most optimistic person alive. Like, I just always try to look for the good to come out of whatever and whoever. But the truth is, that's not always the case. Right? It's not always going to be a happily ever after. It's not always going to be uh, bright blue skies and the sun is shining and the birds are chirping and everybody's, you know, tra la 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 la. We're just joyful and gleeful in the Lord. Praise God. That, that's, that's not what's always going to happen. Sometimes, sometimes you're not going to get the loan. Sometimes you're not going to get the house or the car. Sometimes you won't get the man or the woman. Sometimes you, the house will be foreclosed on. Sometimes the cancer won't be cured. Sometimes you will have a heart attack. Sometimes 
And so we can hope all day long, but hope doesn't look at the at the at the outcome. Hope continues to look at the person. Hope was based on their relationship with and to God. That's why in the midst of present trials or future failures, Israel could maintain their hope because God would not fail to fulfill his promise. In saints of God, we too, in present trials and future circumstances, can maintain a modicum of hope because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. When you were in the mess you were in back then, and he got you out of it, when you catch up to the mess that's in the future, he'll be right there waiting for you to help you get out of it then too. Again, it doesn't have to be in our mind according to the world standard positive. It just has to be the will of God. Just has to be his will. It didn't matter how long they had to wait. They could be confident regardless of their circumstances. So if it was a day, if it was a week, if it was a month, a year, if it were years, they could wait. Israel had to wander in the wilderness for how many years? A long time. A long time. But God made that promise a long time before that. And so there's something about waiting under the tense expectation that God allows us to experience. There's something about us trusting in the Lord with all our heart and leaning not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging him and him directing our path. There, there's something to seeking God first and his righteous kingdom and his righteousness and all the other things that, that we're chasing after gets added unto him. There's something about going to the Lord first. There's something about inquiring of God. There's something about seeking him in prayer. There's something about looking at his face in the word. There is something about just giving yourself over to him in spite of yourself. There's something about that's a different worldview. That's a different perspective because the world says you need to, it's all about you. You need to protect yourself. You need to, you know, worry about you and your, I'm, I'm paying my own, I'm minding my own business. I get that. I get that. <laughs> but God calls us into community. Amen. And you and I are not alone in this walk. We're not on our own. Like Patty Liddell said. We are in this together. And if nobody else physically walks with you, know that God's spirit is always with you. Because God said, I will never leave you and nor forsake you. Right? Didn't mean that we wouldn't experience challenges or, or trials along the way, but, but it did. he did say he would be there with us while we're dealing with us. And in the text, he says, I give power to the faint and strength to, to those who lack it. So the encouragement is, is that our hope is not in, in the things or, or not even in the, the outcome, but our hope rests on God. Amen. God will renew the strength of those who are willing to combine, to endure the tension of waiting. He will allow us to soar high like eagles and run with vigor and vitality. No longer mentally and spiritually weary, but able to proceed forward without tiredness. Now that doesn't mean that you won't get tired, but that means that you got a little extra gas in the tank. You know how you ever been, you ever, you ever been on E and you just like, oh my God, where's the gas station? Or, you know, sometimes I get up there and I'm just like, I know I have to get gas, but it just keeps on slipping my mind. And then that light comes on and you just like go into panic mode. And you're like, where? Oh my, how, how much longer do I got to the gas station? Lord Jesus, stretch this gas out. <laughs> and thank God I've never broken down because the fuel uh, is in uh, deficiency. <laughs> But I made it to the to, to the to the station to, to, to reach.
filled. And, and that's, that's, that's kind of what God does is, is that, yeah, even in your tiredness, God will, God, will, God will give you that boost to get you to the, to the filling station. God will, God, will, God will stretch those fields out that it so sustains you until you can find that place of rest. And so in the text, God was letting them know, listen, you're going to have moments where you get tired. You're going to have this consequence uh, imposed on you because of what you did. But but don't don't worry. Don't don't get discouraged because my, my, my grace is sufficient for you and my love is unconditional. And I will help you, help you to get through. So when you feel like you're getting tired, just, just remember that you got my spirit inside of you to keep you and to carry you. When you can't make it anymore, you can lean on me and lean into me. You don't have to. God is the only place where we can fall before him and he will carry us and hold us without judgment, without without reservation. He will pick us up and, and carry us the rest of the way if need be. And some of you may be in that situation right now. It's the end of the year. There's a lot of things happening in our world. There, there's stuff going on. And you may be tired. And God is saying, if you wait, I'll renew your strength. You get to mount up with wings as eagles. You can run and not grow weary. You can, you can go longer than you ever thought you could go. Go. Now that doesn't mean oh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take breaks. You know, we're not we're not robots, we're human beings. And sometimes when we go, 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 God will let you know, no, no, it's time to <laughs> sit, sit, sit. <laughs> right? God, God will God will make you lay down <laughs> in the green pasture. Thank God it's the green pasture and not the side of the road. And so we, we, we exercise wisdom. We use good judgment. And we run this race at the pace God is telling us to run it. Sometimes there will be moments of sprinting. There will be running fast. And then other times there will be a slow pace. And then other times there will be moments where we pause. Right? Moments where we get to relax just for a second to catch our breath. And then there's other times you're running in that race and you just got to grab the water while you go and refuel as you go forward. No longer, no longer mentally and spiritually weary, but able to proceed forward without tiredness. I said all that to say this, old church. This text teaches us that our hope, our 